Hello, everyone. Welcome to Leaders and Changemakers, a series by the Boston College Media Alumni Network, presenting you with inspiring industry leaders with valuable stories to share. My name is Chris Russo, and I'm the president and founder of the BC Media Alumni Network. Thanks so much to everyone who's joining us live tonight. And I encourage you to uh, use the chat to ask your questions. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat all night tonight to ask your questions during our conversation. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest tonight. Chris Meyer is an Emmy-nominated and award-winning producer who has worked for the past 20 years with the comedic duo, The Fairley Brothers, under their production banner, Conundrum Entertainment. He's worked as a creative executive, production executive, and producer on such blockbuster hits as There's Something About Mary, classic, Me, Myself, and Irene, Dumb and Dumber 2, and many, many more. And Conundrum's body work has resulted in over $2 billion in box office sales. Chris has also independently worked on a number of films and TV shows, including sports Emmy-nominated documentary, The Lost Son of Havana, and The Do-Over, starring Adam Sandler, that was recently released on Netflix. Chris is also the co-founder and CEO of podcasting network, Mud House Media. So in short, he produces incredible content and has told stories in a variety of ways, and we are so excited to learn more from him tonight. Chris, thank you so much for, for joining us. Hey, Chris, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. So Chris, you're a Massachusetts guy. You're yeah. double eagle. You, did, you were at BC High, then you went to Boston College. At what point did you sit back and say, you know what, I think I want to go to Hollywood? Uh, it's a good question. Well, in the early 90s, when I got out of BC, the job market was not good. It was, it was actually pretty weak. And I was, a, I was a little bit lost on where I was going, and what I was wanted to do. And uh, I kind of floundered for about a year or two out of school, you know, whether I was going to go to law school, you know, go work in a financial services company, et cetera. And I just, I just, I, I was a bit lost. And, uh, but I was always a film buff. I used to take the tea to Kendall Square, Harvard Square, Coolidge Corner. I'd go sit and watch movies, you know, by myself. I'd go to the Harvard Silent Movie Film Festival in my free time. And, and one day I came home and my mom said, you know, what are you doing? You know, and I said, what do you mean, mom? She said, well, well, you love the movie business. Why don't you try to get in the movie business? I said, how do you do that? You know, <laughs> and I called the mass film office. I worked on a BU grad film, you know, in the middle of nowhere, an hour from where I lived. And I came home and after about eight weeks and my dad said, what do you think? I said, I love it. He said, what? You work hard, you get paid for it. You're losing money. I said, I, I know, I know, I know. And uh, I luckily, I met uh, gals in the camera department. They loved having us. And about a week later, they called and, and said, we'd love to have you come work with us. And I said, you know, I, I can't work for free. You know, uh, my student loans were kicking in and all that. And, and uh, they said, no, in a series of Snickers commercials. So for the next six months, I PA'd as a, in the, in the, the Snickers campaign was leading up to the, um, 1994, I believe, Summer Olympics or 96. And, uh, they, you know, they were all promotional campaigns for, for the Olympics. And then I did that for about a year and realized if I really want to make a go of it, I need to leave. So I saved up some, uh, some money and, and, and threw caution to the wind. And being young and, and, and uh, dumb and gullible and naive, I told my dad, I'm going to make movies, Ma. My dad's like, Jesus Christ, you know, see you in six months. And I headed west. I called the big move. Right. So th that's one thing I wanted to ask, just to get more specific about, like that beginning of your career. So you graduate BC, and then what? You move, you know, right out to LA, or or how? Well, did that it was work? it was about a year. Like I said, I, I worked on. I, I started kind of poking around in the movie business locally for about a year and a half, two years, and then I said, okay. At the time, they did not have a tax credit here, so it was mostly commercials, and one one you know major motion picture would come a year. And, and I knew I wanted to try to make movies. And uh, I just knew if I wanted to do that, I needed to move. So, uh, you know, I had never moved 15 minutes from my house, never mind 3,000 miles from everything I know and love, right? And uh, for an if. And, uh, you know, it was the toughest time in my life and the best time in my life. You know, I went out there with no money and no network, just showed up and started grinding it out. Yes, yeah, so let's talk more about the, those kind of more difficult times because I know a lot of people who, who move out there and they're trying to pursue the, the, the kind of film or television production 
uh, kind of producer route, they face a lot of challenges along the way. So can you share some of the challenges that you, you kind of faced, especially early on in your career and how you addressed yeah, well, and overcame those? I, I, I talked to a lot of kids and, and whether they're, you know, and, and, and folks thinking about getting the movie business. And, and, and early on, I say one of the toughest things, at least for me and what I think most, you know, unless you come from Los Angeles, you know, the, one of the biggest things to do is move, you know, and, and, and that's where you grow up. I definitely grew up when I moved to Los Angeles. You know, and um, even simple things on where to live, you know, is a big deal in Los Angeles. You know, it's, they, they don't have, they, I mean, until recently and even now, they, they don't really have a public transportation system like they do back east in New York, Boston, Chicago, with the subway system. So it's very crucial, uh, e even depending if, you know, you're a guy or a gal, especially for the gals on where you live in Los Angeles is key, especially when it comes to Hollywood on um, how to get around and things like that. So I just showed up and I just, you know, just started talking to people and hanging around. And I, I met a lot of folks. I play a lot of basketball and I met a lot of guys playing and get, uh, playing basketball that ended up leading me to my first, you know, job, if you want to call it in Los, in Los Angeles, which ended up, or maybe my second job, a third job that led me to meeting with the Fairley brothers. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and tell me a little bit more about that meeting with the Fairley brothers. Because last time we talked, or a few a few times ago that we talked, you told me a little bit about where and when that happened. Can you share a little bit about how that meeting kind of happened, how they knew who you were, and how that all came to be? I, again, I apologize for the lighting. I didn't have much time to set stuff up for you, but uh, oh, you look great. Uh, um, so playing basketball, I love music, and a bunch of the guys said, "Hey, a new blues club opened up the street. We should go up there." I said, "Cool." And I ran out of money and I was walking around Santa Monica with a resume, which there was really none of. And uh, I met this gentleman at a hot dog stand who's now my friend. And he had the name of the club on the hat, on his hat. And I said, hey man, do you work there? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, I desperately need a job. I told him where I went to school just so he didn't think we had somewhat of a half of a brain anyways. And um, he said, you play hoop on the beach? I said, yeah. He said, I need a bouncer. Uh, I was like, Ooh. oh, okay, I need a job and I need money right now. So I took a job bouncing and I thought quickly, typically in blues clubs, it's a little more, you know, it's an older crowd, a little more tame. So I ended up working there for the first four years of my LA life and, you know, worked my way into bartending and bar backing. And that's where I met the Fairley brothers. They used to come in there um, and they knew the owner. And, uh, we, we hit it off just coming from the same part of town, same sense of humor. They're, they're about, you know, 12, 13 years older than I. Um, and, you know, when you're out there on your own and, and your family's, you know, your, your friends become your family, mm -hmm. you know, for holidays, everything, because, you know, you, you, most of your family's back east if you're from back east. And um, so uh, what happened was I was getting close to packing it in. I'd been out there five years. Nothing was really happening. You know, everyone back, back east, is, you know, their lives are moving on, getting married, MBAs, law school, buying houses, and I'm still kind of floundering. And uh, I hadn't been home in a couple of years. And then uh, my grandparents had passed within like a month of each other. So I was back with it twice in a month and I hadn't been home in two years. And my mom said, you know, what, what are you doing out there? And I said, you know what, mom, you're right. And I always thought as long as I gave it a true valiant effort and it wasn't just, you know, sitting on the beach in Malibu surfing for five years, I'd be okay coming home and starting over. And uh, I, you know, I, I told my mom, I'd give it six more months. I went back to my friend Tadu on the bar. I said, Hey man, you know, this has been great, but I, I, I got to start living again. I was starting to really, it was starting to get a really uh, uh, deep, if you will. You know, I, I was working seven days a week. I wasn't enjoying LA and that's okay. That's part of the struggle for everyone that goes out there in any job where you, you got to put your time in and, and, and earn your stripes, if you will, you know, and uh, I got a call from, from the Fairleys out of the blue. And keep in mind, back then, there were no cell phones or, or, or internet. So I got a call at my, uh, you know, my uh, bunker of, a, of, a, of, of an apartment, you know, and they said, hey, Chris, it's beating Bob. What are you doing? I said, is that a joke? I said, I'm curled up in the fetal position in the closet watching the light bulb burn. I'm 
I'm down 62 pounds. I'm about to move it in my truck. I told the loan guy I died. I told the credit card guy I died. <laughs> and if I, I don't know if I should pull the trigger or hurl myself off the building. And they said, is it that bad? I said, it's not that good. <laughs> and then they said, do you want to come work with us? I said, when? What do you need me to do? I have my flip-flops on and my boxers, and that's it. Let's go. And uh, and that movie, it, 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 you know, we're pretty good with deadlines. And and they told me when this would happen. And, and, and I learned, obviously, quickly being in L.A., and a lot of the folks watching know that movies may never happen. For whatever reason, they come and go with the wind. Even if you have Brad Pitt and Steven Spielberg, they may go – away quickly so the time kept coming for this movie to happen and nothing was happening and i said no no matter what happens i'm going to go home and, and, and they'll you know if it happens they'll call me i was trying to figure out because you know i was their acquaintance not their friend yet you know and, and finally they uh i got the call and you know I, I i date myself but when i'm talking presently to kids i tell them i was the malcolm butler I hit this, the, the Super Bowl of movies that year with something about Mary. And I started as uh, Pete and Bob's assistant. And then over, we had an incredible run with the success of that film for 15, 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm. Got a development deal with 20th Century Fox. And then I worked my way up from associate producer to co-producer to producer to now I'm their partner. We work independent of each other now, but I have multiple projects with both of them. And uh, it's just been, it's, I've been, you know, blessed and, and grateful and luckily, lucky uh, it's happened. Yeah, I mean, you have such an incredible success story and you've had to overcome a lot. And I love when you talk about how there was a point where you said, I might just have to turn around and go home, right? You almost gave up because you had yeah. put in lots of work. It's not that you didn't work, you put in a lot of work and you weren't seeing those results. And I think a lot of people can share that experience because there's so many young, talented people hustling and not enough spaces for, for everybody all the time. And so the fact that, you know, you overcame all of that and you struck gold and hit it big and, and were able to to align with them and, and produce some of our most classic Hollywood comedy films. There's something about Mary's my mom's favorite, by the way. She told me to bring that up during the event. Uh, we'll, <laughs> so have that, to get, we'll have to get her some swag. Yeah, we'll get her some swags. Uh, you know, I it's a great film. I love that as well. And, you know, what is it like to work alongside the Fairley brothers and some of Hollywood's biggest celebrity talent? What's that like? Oh, it's I mean, you know, when I, when my first job with them, I had no idea what I was doing, right? I'm green and and I, I, I had a newfound respect for comedy because most folks, comedy I think is one of the toughest movies to make. You know, you can make a drama, it's pretty straightforward, right? You can adapt a screenplay, a novel, an article, whatever, pretty straightforward. But when you can make the world laugh in the masses, you know, everyone's got their own sense of humor, right? But be able to do that on a mass scale takes, it's quite a gift, you know, especially with what we do is, you know, a lot of our movies are all centered around the lovable loser, if you will, right? And, 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 and uh, especially with the guys that have done around, especially people with disabilities, you know, they're, they're you know, that it's at the forefront of topic in discussion today, but they've been doing it for 25 years. We've put most folks with disabilities in, in you know, probably ever in Hollywood in our movies. And, and, and you wouldn't even know they're handicapped, right? Excuse me. Um, but yes, being alongside them, um, you know, they helped launch, you know, Ben Stiller's career. He'd been in the business already. And with the something about Mary, you know, that, that his, his star took off. Uh, working with Jim Carrey. I mean, Cameron Diaz is incredible. Um, but yeah, just, just working alongside those guys and, and being a, you know, osmosis and a sponge, you learn quick. And the nice thing about starting off as an assistant is you're talking to everybody from the PA all the way up to the studio head, and you're just taking phone calls from everybody from day one to the script being written to you know, the release of the film. So I tell a lot of kids, you should, I mean, depending on what you wanna do, you should either be a producer's, producer's assistant, director's assistant, uh, or a writer's assistant, if you want to do any of those three, because that's where you're going to really learn, learn the game, you know? Right. And, and you, and you in that way, find a mentor or a few mentors, which I think is 
very important in general, but especially important in Hollywood to yeah. have those people that you can look up to and learn from. And that might bring you, you know, from project to project as well, which is something that's really important. Yeah. Um, what you talked about, you work with the, the Fairley brothers, a lot of great celebrities. Do you have one celebrity that stands out to you or somebody we Bill all Murray. know your favorite to work with? Somebody Bill you really Murray. love. Bill Murray. Awesome. He's done it all. He's seen it all. He's a veteran. I mean, he's one of the original SNL cast members. You can't beat that. Yeah. He's very uh, dynamic in all the roles he takes. I mean, even till today, you know, he's just, he's got an interesting repertoire and he's uh, an interesting cat. You know, he's, uh, he's very eccentric, but uh, still grounded and, and just a great guy to work with. He's a true pro, you know. Um, I also want to mention for people who are here live with us tonight, feel free to send some questions in the chat. We have about 20 minutes left and I want to make sure that we answer all your questions as well. I'll be looking at the chat in a couple of minutes. So feel free to send those in. Um, you know, Chris, we're in this pandemic right now and production has obviously come to a halt in many places or at least very much slowed. Yeah. What does it look like from where you are? Um, it's a good question. So from, from almost day one of the pandemic, what became kind of, um, I'm gonna say the norm that's being uh, animation production is still being done because it can be done remotely. Mm -hmm. So even actors who are, might be at home or taking more jobs, at least just to stay you know, fresh and, and on the cutting edge with, with animation. So that's been actually pretty active. Now making movies and TV shows has come to a halt until recently with, with the two or three week opening, depending on what state you're in. Um, and even then, Depending how prolific you are, you know, Peter Fairley's, sh you know, shooting a movie in New Zealand um, and, and leaves, you know, leaves very soon uh, because they've only had one case of COVID in, in New Zealand from what I understand. So, and they're only, you know, again, a central crew. Typically our crews are very open where you and your whole family can come down and visit for the day and hang around. And we usually have multiple families and it's just a really open set. That's not going to be the case here, but it, I hear other, other, you know, there's a lot going on in Atlanta, uh, but again, it's just starting up, but a lot of productions, and I know a lot of teams are still trying to figure out how, how to make people safe. And, 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 and you know, because if you think about it, I, I was talking to someone the other day, we're almost like a construction site. Construction is still one of the only jo physical jobs you still, you physically need to be there. You physically need to build the building, right? Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of, true physical jobs left right out there in the world and filmmaking is still one of them i know you can still do the cgi and green screen and and, and put on a movie you know but if you know if you want to make uh, uh you know live action it's it's still as a lot of folks watching know it, it's it's uh still needs to be a physical job and it's as you know it's grueling and, and the hours are brutal when you first when you're in the middle of production Right. So, so as you said, one production that's continuing, obviously, is animation, but another one is podcasting. And yeah. as I mentioned before, you're the CEO and co-founder of Mudhouse Media, which is a podcasting network that's featured some real major talent from uh, tennis legend Patrick McEnroe to top chef contestant and celebrity chef Tanya Holland. Obviously, podcasting is a totally different type of storytelling from what you were used to right. you know, producing films and television. Tell us about how you made that pivot in the type of storytelling that you were doing. Well, if, you know, just what you said, it's audio storytelling, right? And, and NPR does the best job at it, right? I mean, uh, in, in, in iHeart with, with their audio storytelling. And the reason I, I, I was interested in, uh, two years ago, we had an app company and, and I was in with uh, a VC, uh, some VC friends that were, you know, interested in our app company. And, um, you know, at, at the close of the meeting, they said, I said, what are you investing in? What's your sweet spot? And they said emphatically podcast. So you cut to a year ago, I started being asked to be guest on podcasts. You should start your own podcast. And, and just a lot of people started poking around. I started doing a little homework and due, due diligence. And uh, a friend of mine uh, comes from 25 years of radio programming, program directing and multiple national awards. So I called him and, and we started doing a little more homework. And um, I just, I called these, you know, some PE, you know, private equity and uh, venture capitalist guys I know. And I said, you know, is it too late? You know, is it saturated? There's 750,000 podcasts, right? 
And they said, Chris, no, it's just beginning. 85% of those podcasts are, you know, two kids in Brighton talking about where they're going to go have some fun Friday night, you know? So my, my partner, Mark Carey and I decided, you know, to build a network is the best way to go. And, and it's, it's interesting. We have two verticals. One is originals and one is on the corporate side. And early on, we were getting into the corporate side because that would generate cash flow immediately. And then COVID hit. So we had to pivot to the originals. Mm-hmm. And that's when, you know, like today, this week has been busy and we have an incredibly beautiful African American celebrity chef, Tanya Holland. We just launched her show Tuesday. She's out of Oakland. She has a, comp- uh, a kitchen, uh, her restaurant's called Brown Sugar Kitchen. She's incredible. Her first guest is Quest Love. And we have, over her first season, we have, uh, in aggregate about 80 million in social media from Dominic Crenn to uh, 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 Jesse Tyler Ferguson from Modern Family. A lot of musicians, celebs, et cetera, celebrity chefs. It's just been an incredible run, especially while we're being blessed that during COVID, we're building, you know, a young company, new company with in thriving, not let's say thriving, but um, building a company a mix under the cloud, if you will, when, when sadly, you know, huge corporations and small business owners are collapsing every day. So it's been, it's been, uh, we, we were lucky to bring on the, the, the former CMO of Cadillac and the former CMO of Volkswagen. She helped launch Truly for Boston Beer slash Stem Adams. Her name is Liz Van Zora. She's been incredible building out our digital platform and, and uh, we're just excited to keep moving. Absolutely. Before I get to the the questions in the chat, one other thing I want to ask you about is, you know, the way you kind of brand and position Mudhouse is that it's a diverse podcast network. You really want to represent a diversity of voices. So can you tell us a little bit more about why kind of diversity inclusion is important to you and Mudhouse and some of the types of voices that you have involved in the podcast? Well, I mean, you know, diversity inclusion is, 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 I mean, if you look, it's funny if you, if you, um, if you look at the pecking order on the small company we have, we're, you know, the majority of our team is women. And, 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 uh, and, it, and it's not just, you know, it's, it's all built on merit, but at the same time, you know, we've, you know, inclusion is a big part of my life, never mind my business life. And the more folks we can have uh, and give opportunity to, not only as our, we call our pod, partners, partners, because we, we, we share duties with them. So, um, and it just, it makes it that much more interesting. You know, mm-hmm. we could, well, everything from a cybersecurity podcast to Tanya Holland, to the McEnroe brothers, to Euclid, to, you know, we, I was just talking, we want to set up a kid's division, you know, uh, and do all that strategically. Eventually we want to get into, you know, more of the, um, you know, we, we have three true crime shows coming up and then we're, we're, we're um, a little further down the line. We want to build out, you know, our, you know, um, homecoming, if you will, you know, and our, our, our shows that will become our war of the worlds, if you will, and fireside chats. So, but yeah, um, you know, it's like I said, we were talking about one of the, one of the, we can talk this later, but one of the TV shows we just, you know, uh, cast Alaska. In, 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 in Jinx Monsoon. Yeah, you know, two, it, two big drag queens from, uh, yeah. they were, became well known from the show RuPaul's Drag Race, but now have, you know, careers of their own. Yeah. And it's yeah. fun, you know, it's just, it's, it's and it, it makes for a better quality product in the storytelling, whether it's audio or video or film. David wants to know, what are the elements that you look for when commissioning a podcast? Mm, good question. Uh, is that person or space or dialogue or subject matter engaging? Um, we also look for some folks with, you know, that may already have a little uh, street cred with them because it's not, it's very difficult to build a podcast from scratch, you know, which we've, we've done and we're doing with, with, with folks on our platform. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it, so it's a little bit of, you know, where their street, street cred is. But also, if, even if they don't have any street cred, if they're that compelling and, and the subject matter is that compelling and something different, fresh and new, we definitely want to listen and hear, and hear these folks out. 
And Jenny, Jenny's wrote uh, something in the chat. She said, you know, you didn't get to produce her at 22. You were, you were in California. You happened to make a connection from, from being at the right place at the right time. And you took a big chance as, and took a job as a bouncer. Um, Jenny is saying, look, kids these days wouldn't necessarily want to just settle. So what words of advice do you have? for people looking for jobs? Do they wait for the perfect thing or do they take something along the way? And what are those kind of entry level jobs in film? And um, kind of how would you recommend people get themselves, get that foot in the door into those jobs? Yeah, well, great question, Jenny. Hello. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, when I went out there, I, I knew nothing about networking, right? I knew I had no knowledge of, again, I was out there pretty naive. However, now a lot of the kids like call and network as much as you possibly can before you get out there. And depending on your resources, you need to save real money because the cost of living in Los Angeles is three times that of pretty much wherever you live other than New York, right? Maybe Chicago and Boston, but uh, it's not cheap. And, and, and then call your, local, your, your alumni offices and then at, start talking to everybody and anybody you know in and around the business. You know, I love, there's a, there's a couple of kids from my uh, alma mater in high school that reached out. They've been out there thriving, but it's, this is a great story. One of these kids called me. He was working at a burger joint in Boston. And he said, I got my, my uh, master's in screenwriting from Emerson. You know, and, and I was doing an independent film here in Boston at the time. So I walked him around the set and showed him around. And, I said, send me your two best scripts. I said, Cause a lot of folks want to send you multiple scripts. I can't read like that. It's just, it's too much. You'll get inundated. Right? So I always tell everyone, send me your most commercial script and send me your most proud script. And I read his two scripts and I said, Hey man, I don't know what you want to do. He was just about to get a teaching job and settle down. I said, but if you want to work in the film business, you have the talent you need to leave and leave right now. And his first job, and I didn't have a job for him then, was at a place called Deluxe, which does all the color timing and stuff like this. But he got a job packing boxes because he couldn't find a job right away. And, and the woman that was his boss like three weeks in was looking at his resume and said, what are you doing here? And he said, I, I, what do you mean? She said, you're packing boxes. He said, I, I, I don't know anybody. I needed a job. And she said, no, 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 no. You're going to go work for my husband. So he ended up working in post-production for Alias, which was created by J.J. Abrams. Then he goes on to Lost. And then he becomes J.J.'s right hand. And then what goes on, to, now he's one of the head writers on Westworld. Incredible success story. So wow. do whatever you can within with, to get in and around the business. And then, you know, unfortunately, you know, you, early on, unless you get lucky, some people do, you, you take that PA job and in, in, you know, office job in and around the studio and do whatever you can. And next, you know, you just got to persevere. I mean, myself and one other gentleman, after about five years, all the guys we ended up hanging out with, most of them went home. And two of us stuck it out. And I think with, with perseverance and, you know, um, hard work and just being able to stick it out, it'll work for you. Mm -hmm. Like any job, you know, in any business or any space you want to get into. Absolutely. I think that's great advice. Uh, last question from the chat tonight. Ed wants to know, what was your single most memorable or best moment uh, in the business while in LA? And what's your most, uh, your must visit bar or restaurant there? Ooh, what's my best moment in LA in, or in movies? He said while in LA. So anything that's happening in LA, that's been awesome. Mm. Could be movies. Yeah, no, um, Good question. Uh, probably one of the most interesting moments and memorable, especially early on in my rookie year with something about Mary, was I sat in on a test screening. And I didn't, for those that don't know, when, when you have the move, and we used to, this is interesting. Professor Mahalchek at Boston College, when we were edited the movies back here, just coincidentally, the Fairley brothers were from here. And they were living in Duxbury at the time. And we edited our movies, something about Mary and Duxbury. So we did, we, we do a, we do informal test screenings for family and friends. And I did them at BC for our first three movies. 
So we, we, when we know where the problems lie, we ask you guys what you like and don't like. When we go back to do the formal one in front of all the executives and the marketing teams and everybody in Hollywood, then they, they have a marketing team where we do it in three theaters with the public. And I'm sitting in a row of young men, a little younger than me, and all of a sudden the joke started to come. And I, they were crossing over me, high-fiving, all of a sudden you see everybody's heads, the executives start popping up, oh my, oh my God. And all of a sudden they realize we have, we have something special here. And I never forgot that. Mm. The other thing is I always feel like I'm in Hollywood because at times you get desensitized by it, right? It becomes a job, right? But it, I always feel when you're on the mixing stage and you have like with the Three Stooges, you have a 325 piece orchestra watching your film and your scenes and playing to it it's pretty magical mm -hmm. beautiful that's great. Uh, my favorite restaurants depending on the mood i'm in whether it's a slice of pie or uh, you want you know nobu um ooh. depends on where you are most of my la life's been in santa monica and venice santa monica and venice so that's where i spend most of my time but Mm -hmm. I love everything from Snug Harbor to Spumoni to Felicia's to Abbott Kinney Pizza. The best pizza in LA, I think, <laughs> at least sit down is Paisana. It's in Brentwood. If you want a quick slice to go, you go to Abbott Kinney Pizza. Yes. Us New York and Boston folk are very particular about our pizza. So yes. to know where to get a good slice in LA is uh, yes. important to help people. To Unless know. you want Thai sushi, there's incredible places. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. I'm a big foodie. <laughs> That's great. I, I can't get to all the other questions, but uh, Brandon's here. He says hello. Angelica is here. Uh, Darby Duffin, who's an incredible documentary uh, filmmaker, hey is also here. Oh, and great. Um, so thank you all for your questions, and I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Um, Chris, the one last thing I have for you is what's next for you? What are the opportunities that are really getting you excited right now? Uh, building out the podcast network and the more and more folks that come in to, to help us build that out. And then we have, uh, you know, multiple projects and, you know, on the goal line, if you will, in film and television that hopefully will come to life sooner than later. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, um, I don't want to get too into it because we'll get, we'll get too deep into it with, with the projects we have, but uh, a couple of them are right on the goal line and, and getting ready, hopefully. And, and the one, one, the interesting thing about COVID for Hollywood is, Typically, one of the toughest things to get done is someone to read your script. Nobody wants to read. You know, even if you're prolific, it's just people don't want to read. Well, now, because of COVID, everybody's home. And there's more development and reading being done than ever before. And they know there's going to be a huge uh, uh, push for new content, you know, um, which lends itself back to, I mean, Universal and AMC just did this huge deal, right? Where... You know, that, that's going down a different rabbit hole, but Universal and AMC were at odds with each, with each other until COVID. Now they partner up to release movies instead of 75 to 90 days after the theatrical release. They want to now release to VOD and rentals, you know, 17 days after the movie comes out. So it'd be very interesting to see how that, that plays out also with the other uh, um, cinema owners. Right. Right. Yeah. Look, this, obviously, this is a very difficult time for a lot of people. You know, Hollywood production is in a place where I think it's never been before. And I think people are going to have to really, like you've done, um, pivot and, and find those opportunities that matter to them now. And I know there's a bunch of independent filmmakers on and, and BC students and young alums that mm -hmm. are aspiring to get to a, a place like, like you are now. And, you know, my advice for them would be to just create and create as much as you can. I don't know if you have any, a quick piece of advice for people that are in that position. What, what should they be doing right now to like optimize their time? Just keep writing and start making movies. You know, you can go to film school. You can do all the film theory, all the film, everything you want to do, but start making the movies on your iPhone and don't right. stop. If you want to write, I tell everybody the toughest thing to do about writing is sitting your ass in a chair and doing it, right? But if you do it, do five pages a day, try to set some goals and you want to write, you'll become a writer. Right. Right. Set that schedule, set that routine and really go after those goals because I, I agree with you. I think just creating during this time is the most valuable thing you can do. Yep. Um, 
Chris, where can we find you or Mudhouse? How do we how do we see more of what you're up to right now? Uh, on the on the platform, you can see us at MudhouseMedia.com. It's M is in Mary, U is an under double D. Mm -hmm. uh, house H O U S E Media.com uh, for our, our network as we grow. Um, and that's about it. I mean, otherwise I'm around if anybody needs me. That's great. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay. Really appreciate it. And we really appreciate your incredible story and your perspective uh, right now, especially. Uh, I just want to say, you know, the conversation doesn't end here. Please give us a follow on social media at BC Media Alumni and check out our YouTube channel for all of our past episodes in this series. I actually want to end tonight on a personal note uh, with an exciting announcement. This has been, it's been incredible to do this series uh, for the past couple months. And I've received such a positive response uh, from everyone. I've had people reaching out to me asking me like, hey, Chris, can you help me launch my podcast or my webinar? Or could you help me improve my social media presence and, and grow my audience during this time? And so with my extensive network of contacts and my background in content creation and production communications, I'm excited to announce the launch of Russo Strategic Partners. Congratulations, man. Doing, I didn't think I'd be doing awesome. that six months ago, but here we are. And uh, if you're looking to hone your, you know, your digital presence and grow your audience, I'm your guy. I can help you do everything from, you know, launch your webinar, design your graphics, craft your social media content, and also most importantly, really form those partnerships that help you grow your business. So I'm looking to connect with more people, especially BC Eagles who kind of need these services right now. So if you'd like to work together, shoot me an email at chris at russostrategicpartners.com. You're hired. Thanks, Chris. It's, you know, it's so it's, funny. It's, by the way, real quick, I just want to say thank you for reaching out to me. And what you've done as a young guy and a young man in creating the BC Media Alumni Network is bar none because, uh, you know, Jenny Hansen, there's a bunch of us getting together and becoming friends because of you, which we would never have met. And it's interesting that since BC does have a lot of, you know, media folks in it, it's never been done before. So, That's right. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. And I was just going to say also that you were one of the first people that I talked to in the early stages of this thing when I said, Chris, I got this idea. And you picked up the phone and you talked to me and you said, this is a great idea. This is something I need. Run with it. And here we are a year later uh, with some really great work, really getting to engage and connect people during this time that people feel kind of disconnected. And I'm happy to be sitting with you here a year later uh, in, in this place. Likewise. Cool. Great. All right. Well, thank you again to Chris Meyer and everyone who's joined us tonight, and we will see you next Thank week. you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.